Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Dixon. Um, I've been engaged in flood defences mainly in East Anglia for the last best part of 50 years and involved in archaeology for about 18 months. So I know a bit about civil engineering and coastal protection, very little about archaeology. Um, and I'm not an academic. So what you're going to get this afternoon is kind of, you know, in 20 minutes, you're going to get the history of flood defences and how they might or might not impact on archaeology. So it's a real quick look through. Um, to today's talk, um, we need to know first, before we can answer some of the, the main question of the, uh, what impacts uh, does coastal archaeology, what impacts do flood defences have on coastal archaeology, what coastal defences do we have, why do we have them? And then we can get on to impacts. And also ask the question, what if we don't defend the coast? What happens when climate change really bites? So we need to know for East Anglia, where are they? What are they, natural and man-made? How long are they? And what do they protect? So as examples, we have, if you like, kind of uh, Defences like this in North Norfolk, sand dunes, a bit of revetment to the Thames. This is uh, down on Canvey Island. Uh, just out of interest, that one will cost the, the Canvey Island one between five and ten thousand pounds per pace you do along that sea, what it costs to build it. The one on, on the other side here is the kind of natural one, might cost a couple of hundred quid to repair it. Big differences in costs. Where are they? So starting in the north up in Lincolnshire there, you've got a whole mix as you go around the coast there, and you can see there are a lot from natural dunes, <coughs> beaches, clay walls, a lot of clay walls around the coast. You have some high land, um, some mixtures. Uh, and when you get down to the Essex coast, it's, it's the whole thing is, is heavily defended. Uh, and in actual fact, the Essex coast alone is uh, some 500 miles uh, of coastline. That's one and a half times as long as the Dutch coast for one county. What are they? So, the natural ones, sand dunes. I'm sure you all know what sand dunes are, and they're mainly limited in East Anglia to kind of uh, North Norfolk. Uh, there's a few other bits and pieces in Suffolk that size well. When you get to, to Suffolk itself, uh, there's the old road, then you have natural beaches. Um, and coming down the coast, Essex is, is a salt marsh coast. There's still about two and a half thousand hectares of salt marsh left. And you can see there how these natural kind of meadows of the sea on a storm um, will bust up wave action um, down to high to cliffs. Cliffs we have it in North Essex and also large parts of, of the Norfolk coast, high level cliffs. But you must remember that the cliffs in East Anglia are very fragile material, it just washes away, whereas those on the west coast are just a hard material. So basically, you've got a coastline which um, is subject to a lot of erosion and, and rapid change. Man-made defences, uh, earth sea walls, concrete revetment on the front, um, these heavy duty kind of stuff which you might have in, in areas that like, like Canby Island where areas are built up. The Thames barrier, there's other barriers apart from the Thames on the air. Um, and then this is off Clacton where you have these, it's half of Norway brought in at huge expense to do an offshore wave break to bust up those waves and you're pumping a beach behind. They're, they're classed as hard defences. They are trying to kind of bust up those waves as opposed to soft defence, my flat salt, my sand dunes, which, um, if you like, whatever God you believe in does for you. Man-made soft defences. Um, recharge, manage realignment, hybrid soft and, of, uh, soft and hard. Now, the, the great thing with these defences Okay, they are man-made. So here, this is called managed alignment. This is the old sea wall runs along there, new sea wall goes behind. The reason that's done is that the old sea walls are getting too expensive to maintain. So you move the old sea wall back, and in between you get an area of salt marsh which has the impact of taking out those waves energy. Where you can't do that, you can bring in, these are kind of dredgings from harbours or marinas. Uh, you can bring it in a shallow draft boats, and you can pump this sort of material up sands and gravels and it will keep the storms off, the worst of the storms off. <coughs> Hybrids, a, a mix of salt marshes, these kind of brushwood fences um, to, to more heavy duty concrete in the front. Uh, and likewise, you can see there this uh, soft cliff with they're trying to hold it in place with some rock. 
it's not going to work, but it makes people feel happier. <laughs> In a straight line, so taking the sea walls and defences generally, east to Anglia, 1,200 miles. That's a straight line from London to Athens. And I mentioned earlier about Essex, about the 500 miles, just for one county, that's a man-made defence from where we're sitting now to Aberdeen, one county. There's an awful lot of evidence going into it. What do they protect? Um, the slide there is in German, it's the only one I could find. But uh, basically the blue bits are, um, are what's defended, uh, it's mainly agricultural land. There are some kind of nature reserves poking around in here, the broads there. And these browner bits are what would happen on, so the blue bits are where, if you like, a spring tide, a tide you get on uh, new moon or full moon would get to if you didn't have those sea walls in place. The brown bits are what would happen with flood under extreme tides, perhaps a once every 50 year event. They aren't that huge an area, but they do protect a lot of assets. So um, nature reserves protected by law, European law, might not be protected in four years time when we leave Europe, but it might be. Uh, I use the word there, conurbation, so a lot of people apparently don't know what a conurbation is, but even, it's a town or a city or whatever, I and mean, this happens to be London. But we all know of coastlines all around the sea, and it's worth bearing in mind that something like 70% of the world's population, the planet's population, lives in floodplains. So you've got a lot of rising sea levels we have, it becomes a problem. So in summary, on that little section, we have a hell of a lot of defences. Um, they need a lot of cash to build and maintain, huge quantities. And they protect billions and billions of pounds worth of built and natural assets. People sometimes say, well, look, you know, the, the Dutch can protect their coast. Does it, you know, can't we do the same? If you lose the Dutch um, defences, you lose half the country. If you lose the defences in East Anglia, you don't actually lose that much land, but a lot of people will be very upset. <laughs> but why have we got them? So we've heard Mary talk about glacials and whatever. Uh, so what I want you to imagine is this is the UK. This is Scotland, OK? This is, this is kind of down in Kent. And along comes an ice edge, a huge weight of ice, and the whole lot tips up with that great weight sitting on it. When that ice melts, it's going to tip back down again. And that's what we're suffering from now. So in kind of old money, then something as long about the Humber is sinking at about six inches, 150 millimetres every century. And seas are still warming from the last ice age, which adds again about a similar amount. So in total, in East Anglia, it's about a foot, 300 millimetres every century. It's dipping gradually under the sea. But why do man make defences? Now, there's going to be a few drawings of sheep here. These are my own drawings. They're very good, I think you'll find. <laughs> um, but once upon a time, there were, and not long ago, there were no seawalls in East Anglia. And sheep <coughs> grazed those into tidal areas. So you had um, sheep's uh, milk, wool, meat, which, if you like, was the mainstay of the coast. And you bear in mind that in those days, going back even to, say, the 14th century, people didn't drink, in this country, cow's milk. It scarred the stomach. You had sheep's milk, sheep cheeses. Uh, and we know from written records that in about, I don't know, 1410, that the sheep's milk cheeses in Essex were as big round as cartwheels, and so sought after they were exported to Holland. You can't find them now. Somebody did try and make them, so they're disgusting. But what happened? So you had the last ice age, sea levels rose, and sheep started to drown. Clacton's been mentioned. I know some of you have been to Clacton now. You go to Clacton, some of the sea front, it's the North Sea in front of you. In 1420, the abbess of St. Osef had to write to her then king or apply to him because her flock of 400 sheep had been swept away in one tide. She wanted a reduction in her, in her tax. So sheep started to drown. So what do farmers do, landowners do? then and now ask the state for help. What are we going to do because, you know, we're getting poorer and poorer. This is meant to represent King Canute, um, who famously tried to keep the sea coming. He didn't do that. What he is trying to demonstrate that even the kind of king of the time could not stop a natural force like the tide. But anyway, they asked the state for help. 
And so the first kind of sea wall were built. They're called wicks. So wick is a, a path. And what they did is to follow this nice high land that, that a, a sheep would walk back on. I mean, you will be across fields and sheep's path kind of tends to wander a bit. And sheep would choose naturally high land and they were kind of built up and, and they were happy chaps, you know. Apart from the fact that this was done by Charles I initially, who getting over his Dutch engineers uh, to drain the fens, to protect the coastline, etc., this was common land that a lot of people made their living from, from eel fishermen to thatchers to wildfowlers, etc., to fishermen. But that land that was claimed, some was given to the Dutch engineers, some was given to Charles I's buddies. Now, this hoped to be one of Cromwell's park bases. What Cromwell did wrong was to cut Charles I's head off, and that didn't go down too well. Charles II came to the throne. He was a boozer and a whoremonger. The people liked him. He carried on the same policy, but with a slightly different kind of style and branding to it, if you like. So, um, yeah, partly a civil war was started because of the sea defences and sheep. Still didn't stop storm surges. Storm surges. So these little walls were built, but a storm surge had come along uh, and... This man was saying, oh, no, not again. Then, so that went on for some time, okay, with storm surge, whatever. Then came the First World War. Uh, we all, most of us know about that, and there was two countries involved. One of them was us. Um, and a guy called Lord Bledisloe was asked, um, come another war, what do we do to stay, save ourselves being starved into submission? And his answer was, let's grow more food ourselves. And part of that was carry on draining and build bigger defences. So the Blenderslow Commission released, if you like, an awful lot of money to improve defences and drain land in the UK. And that's more or less what happened. You might notice now it's not sheep, it's wheat. The farm was growing fat and wealthy. Fish can't get in. And he said, oh, great, you know, this is, this is fabulous for everybody. And then along came 1953. Uh, bearing in mind, in 1953, storm surges still weren't understood at that time. Um, and, you know, in Essex alone, I think something like 130 odd people drowned, more in, in Norfolk and, and uh, Lincolnshire. But this is the situation we had. I remember this as a kid. I wasn't there in the, in the for farm, I was up a hill, but I did go and watch it. So after that, in 1954, the Waverley Commission, another law law, was asked, what do we do? And Waverley said the thing to do is not protect the farmland. It's not that valuable. You can replace it, if you like, uh, quite easily without all this state aid. And so he said, um, don't protect farmland in East Anglia. A natural fact that was completely ignored. And it's worth bearing in mind that um, often in government edicts, if you like, that the only time that practice follows policy is in the dictionary. And so with the help, if you like, of huge agricultural lobby, agricultural chemical industry as well, then um, a lot of sea walls were raised. One thing that uh, he recommended, for example, Waverley, was that at the time, the biggest deaths on Canby Island, there was 2,000 people lived there. Then he said, no more development on Canby. There's 42,000 people there now, all living below sea level every high tide. And we're going to come back to this one. Public finance is now reduced. What do these farmers do now? It's not their fault. And we'll, we'll touch back on that. But that's, if you like, that's the potted history. I mean, it's slightly inaccurate, but near enough. <laughs> I don't want to get the truth in the way too much of why we have deep sea defences in East Anglia. Um, but as things go on, as, as, if you like, sea levels carry on rising, perhaps more so from climate change, then we're going to have to start looking at doing things. This, the outer line there is the Roman coastline. And the same, in Roman times, this is, if you like, what the Norfolk Broads look like. That's where we are now. But we might have to start thinking about going back to that, those kind of Roman coastlines again, because otherwise the country's going to go bust. We haven't got enough money to defend the coastlines we used to. So let's just a summary of the history of coast defences. The last ice age started it. Nobody likes getting wet or drowning, so sea defences are built. Um, there's been a major input and there's the start of the only civil war, and the civil war has created a lot of research for archaeologists. That's <laughs> one of the impacts. One thing with drowning is it's also uh, every civilization, whether you're an Aboriginal Australia 
or you are a First Nations person in Canada or, or whatever, we all have our own great flood myths. Ours is Noah and the Ark. But every single civilization seems to have this. And nobody, as I said, likes drowning too much. So impacts. Um, I divide them into indirect and direct. And it, it, as I said, it's very brief. Um, so you know where we are. This is the Thames here. That's the Isle of Sheppey, Kent, the River Cratch there, the Denji, Mersey, keep on talking about just up here. This is the amount of sediment that sloshes around the North Sea. Background is about 50 parts per million. Um, when you get big storms, that 50 parts can raise up to, say, 6,000 parts in, in an estuary. Now, that sediment would naturally have settled on floodplains. The floodplains aren't there because sea defences are in the way. So what happens, that sediment has to go somewhere. So we have, in East Anglia, um, some areas are building up faster than they should, others are eroding quicker. Things called ebb tide deltas, which I won't go into, it's more complicated, are washing away. But... Um, in the longer term, and by that over a few thousand years, perhaps in the long term, short term, um, is having an impact. Impact two, indirect impact two, dredging off the coast. Uh, you have running down here the old channel. This is just one of the areas of East Anglia where sands and gravels are mined for the construction industry. A lot of it is exported to places like Germany and Holland. Um, and about 10%, so of that 20 million a year which comes out, about 10% are used for beach nourishment, eye flood defences. Uh, it is doing a lot of damage, but it's Crown Estates Marine. Each little area is licensed, but nowhere, in fact, they don't have to <coughs> consider the cumulative effect. It's each license on its own. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that God ain't making this material anymore. And if our grandchildren want it, will you go and dig up the German autobahn? <laughs> Uh, direct impact, one um, built line of coastal defences on historic features. So, pillbox to the Congo War, Martello Tower, uh, Oldborough is a very historic town. What's this is down on the Thames? What's worth noting is that, if you like, his defences to keep out the, the nasty foreigner, not Americans, I hasten to add, um, <laughs> is also the line that's been chosen to keep out the nasty sea. But it's going to have impacts. So when, when sea walls are dark around this way, for example, it does have huge impacts. And areas like this are often, or have been in the past, uh, extra work put into them because of the, if you like, the archaeological importance. Direct impact two, waste splashed down sea walls. We, we tend to build in this country, civil engineers, a two to one slope on the seaward front. Uh, and on big storms, actually, here's the seawall, the wave will wash up, the wave will wash down, and it'll wash out the turn of the seawall. Uh, and if there's anything there of interest, well, that gets impacted on quite quickly. Direct impact three, adjacent excavation, Lambert or Seaward. Well, you've got diggers in there. Anything of importance archaeologically is going to be destroyed. New method of sea defences, uh, this job I was involved in, this is on the Blackwater Abbots Hall. Two things of note, um, the timber walkways that we found at East Mersey, we found some there. And we called the archaeologists in and they said, well, it's a Saxon bridge covered up and it'll be fine because it's protected, if you like, for future generations. And what happens in these sorts of sites, there's the old sea, well, new coast there, old coast here, sediment comes and settles. Anything in there is going to be protected by fine sediments and salt water. So this is quite a benign way of doing a defence. Forcial recharge. Um, so this here is a kind of early Victorian hut for packing up oysters and they were put on sailing boats and taken away to London. It sits on a salt marsh island, washing away rapidly. We can bring in dredgings from places like Harwich, from navigation dredgings, and we are trying to do that and pump up here to protect it uh, as we have done in other areas. They look quite nice, um, and all they're doing is, if you like, they're not stopping erosion, but they're just kind of slowing things down a bit. But let's also look at the impact of archaeology on coastal defences, the reverse of coastal defence impact on archaeology. Another job I was involved in, Brancaster. Um, this is a seven hectare site, uh, North Norfolk. Um, that line of, of sand dunes which are there, which coal sling are fortune, the best part of 20,000 years to hang on to for really a seven hectare field. So we built a new seawall down here um, and let the whole lot go back to the sea again. 
few project channels in. The whole job was costing me, I think the budget was £220,000. Norfolk County Council said we had to have an archaeologist full time in case there was a Roman wreck. £80,000 later, we found one real cream jar. <laughs> now, bearing in mind, people like myself had to go back and raise up money, explain to people why, you know, you just spent 25% of your entire budget for this on a jar in case we found a Roman wreck. Uh, at the time, I really was not pleased because it's quite an awful <coughs> lot of work. But just think about when you, when you, you know, you guys in the future saying about archaeological impacts, um, the poor man doing sea defences. Another one we're involved in at the moment, uh, that's where we found the tusk in the walkway. This is the <coughs> island, I'll show you the hut on which we want to protect. So we raise money locally volunteers and a charity, £60,000 to get the environmental impact done, advertise, the whole lot goes through, and then the MMO comes back because historically England has said that we might have an impact down there on a walkway that's been found by us lot. <laughs> we have to go back and revisit the IA, advertise the whole thing again, and there's like a six month delay and it costs thousands which we have to raise again. There is no possible way that a little tiny dredger, and they are small, coming up here and putting a little bit of only 5,000 Q on there can possibly have an impact on a feature which natural facts is now in London. <laughs> so the summary of impacts, it can have direct and direct, direct and indirect positive impacts, direct and in, indirect negative impacts, and many coastal defences protect features in the city. So let's just have a look at what they are. So if this is at, down at Goldhanger, that's Goldhanger Creek. This is the seawall going round it. So, a nice summary. One red hill protected in situ, great. Uh, one dug right through and mainly destroyed, not so good. One there protected, but because the seawall's in place and it doesn't flood, that's now a sailing club and housing estate. So, you know. Uh, options do we have? Uh, improve, sustain, maintain. I won't go into all of these. Um, there are various options on front defences to either make one bigger and stronger or just let it go back to the sea. Everything, though, in flood defence terms must be judged by the do-nothing option. If no work is done, what's the cost of society? Now, you might think a hectare of farmland is worth £10,000. Take off all the grants every year, and it's hardly worth 500 quid a year uh, in, in total. So you have to look at what are the societal costs in total before you can raise money to do defence. So I think it's going to come back to emergency archaeology. There's that blast of skull there again, same one. This is the, the one the oysterman found. Um, this is the site just down, this is, you know, by Cooper's Beach. Uh, this is what's happening now. The, the seawall is being left to go back to the sea. The agency, the environment agency, responsible flood defences aren't doing anything, it's washing away. This winter it is going to collapse, the first storm. It's, you know, very fragile. Uh, this here is where we found the burial from the Iron Age man. Um, there's all sorts of stuff going on there, I mean, of great importance. And it's one of the things is that to get in there quickly and do some archaeology fast, because when that sea wall collapses, a million tonnes of water is going to go in and out twice a day. Four million tonnes of water is going to impact immediately in front of the seawall. That energy is going to expose an awful lot of stuff. And I think the, the use of volunteers to go down there in a hurry and record is going to be very important. Um, the next impact, well, the next talk was going to be the impacts of climate change. Um, it ain't going to happen now. But let's just consider poor old Aristotle there. And Aristotle had been out in a boat and he looked over the side and seen kind of, if you like, cities under the sea. He'd been up half side of mountains and seen seashells. He didn't know what the answer was, but he did come up with this great quote, translated from the Latin, the same region does not always remain sea or always land, but all change their condition in the course of time. So when we're looking at East Anglia, depending on which model of climate change we look at, but certainly within 200 years, perhaps with 100 years, these areas are going to be wet quite often. And we're going to have to learn to live with it, I think, unless we dam across the North Sea, which the Dutch might want to do. <laughs> so conclusions. Um, so my background is, is in 
<coughs> and sea defences and coastal protection. But archaeology can teach civil engineers a great deal about what the past was and what could happen in the future. And Lara, in your thing, your talk about um, talking to artists, I think talking to civil engineers would be very helpful. Civil engineers, any civil engineers here? I've worked with them all my life. OK, so the civil engineer does four years at university doing maths, and maths only. They don't write essays. It can make your imagination a bit like a caravan site. No disrespect to that. <laughs> but they can learn a lot from other disciplines. Citizen, to me, with my background, is vital in gathering that information. And the last point is there ain't that much time left. You know, Citizen is absolutely vital. I know you're putting your new bid in, and you just hope you get it. So um, that's it. <laughs>